Uh, let me give a shout out to our sponsors real quick and then okay. we'll let you get going. Sounds good. All right. So y'all have heard me say this a few times now if you've been here for a little while, but our sponsors are awesome and we're super appreciative of them. Uh, so at the diamond level, we've got Warner Media. Gold level, we've got Kennesaw State University, Coles College, and the KSU Department of Information Systems. Bishop Fox, who you just heard from, Coal Fire, Genuine Parts Company, and NCR. At the crystal level, we have Critical Path and Synopsis. Silver level, we've got Aaron's, Binary Defense, Black Hills, Core Light, and GuidePoint Security. <clears throat> Bronze level, NCC Group, and our in-kind sponsors, EC Council for Online Training and Secure Code Warrior for the Virtual CTF. Um, Crosshair Information Technology, Joe Gray, and Offensive Security and Pentester Lab made contributions for our raffle. Uh, be sure to go to the raffle giveaways channel to sign up for that. There's some really great prizes in there. Um, and drop a pin on our map so we can see where everybody is hailing from. And with that, I will hand it over to Chloe. All right, wonderful. Hi, everyone. My name is Chloe Rostagi, and today we're going to talk about your brain when you're doing games. So basically, this is going to be more geared towards CTFs, bug bounty, and whatnot. So let's dive in. Now, the first thing to note about this, this is my first time doing a virtual version of this, and this is an interactive talk. So to kick us off and get us started, make sure you are signed in Slack because we're gonna be doing activities together. I'm gonna to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? I take that as a yes. I'm hoping it's a yes, let's put it that way. All right, so um, what I want everyone to do right now is there are gonna be activities throughout this. And so basically what's gonna happen is that I'm keeping tabs of everyone when they give any answers in the Slack. So make sure you're in track, uh, I think protect. So go to track protect. And once you're in there, there's going to be throughout this thing, there's going to be times where I'm going to ask you questions. Now, the people who participate will be able to have a chance to get uh, point threes escalate a subscription for one month for free. Now, whoever answers the most correctly will get that one month subscription. But don't worry, I will give out another one and this will be a raffle. So if you participate and you have provided at least one correct answer, you have an opportunity as well to win a one month subscription on Escalate. And if you're wondering what Escalate is, it basically is what we use for our CTX. So you could do it from home and so on. So let's get started. So first, my name is Chloe Masagi. Um, I am the VP of strategy over at Point3 Security and also the co-founder of WOSEC and I head the SF chapter. And when I'm not doing that, I'm also the founder of Women Hackers, which is a virtual platform that basically non-binary and women can connect together and hack at all levels. So we have workshops, we have uh, basically share anything about CTS and whatnot. So if you're someone who is out there who feels like you wanna join, DM me and let's make that happen. Other than that, I am an organizer for the Hacker Book Club. So we are just wrapping up Tara Wheeler's book on women in tech. And we will be starting in about two weeks with Marcus Carey's Tribe of Hackers. So basically with this book club, we read the books from the hacker community and the hacker community reads them and participates. So yes, we do have the authors do uh, join us for our sessions. And last but not least, if you see in the very bottom corner on the right side, and you will have the opportunity at the very end of this, you'll get to meet my little pup named Sherlock. And that is her at the very bottom with a little diaper on. And yes, she looks like she's, the, she's quite peaceful and whatnot, but I have to let you know, when she puts on any clothes, she stands still. She hates it completely. So I'm gonna turn off my camera so that I can focus now on the, my presentation. I hope you guys don't mind, but let's dive into this. So this is the agenda today. There's gonna to be some history on gamification. Also, how our brains are stimulated by it and why gamification helps security teams. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how gamification has transformed lives, a Q&A, and bonus, I used to do a funny video, 
but since I'm actually at home with all you guys, you guys actually get to see a little bit live of Sherlock, which you see over there in the right side. That is her in her happy face. And yes, she is a Sheba and it is a cat slash dog slash fox. All right, so what is gamification? So gamification is basically games that work on problem solving, processing speed, attention span, and memory. And we're gonna dive into the history of gamification. Now, this is the driest part, but if you focus and pay attention, you might win something very special. So here we go. Um, in 425 BC, dice games were created to actually fight major famine. And in 3100 BC, a first board game was created in Egypt. S&H green stamp marketers sold stamps to retailers who used them to reward customers. 1958, first video game was invented. Charles Cordon founded a consulting firm called Game of Work, and it brings feedback loops and found in sports into the workplace. MUD1 is created by Roy Trabshaw at Essex University. It is the first multi-user virtual world game. Thomas Malone, he published what makes things fun to learn? A study of interestingly motivating computer games. And 1981 was the first ever third 3D video game that was released. American Airlines actually introduces Advantage, the first frequent flyer program known today. And Holiday Inn launches their first loyalty program. National Car Rental launches the first car rental rewards program. And at this time now, 30% of American households own an NES. A new generation of gamers is now born. And Richard Bartle publishes Who Plays MUAs, which divides video game players into four unique types. All right, like I said, make sure you all are in the Slack channel. And if you do not know and you came in late, it is the Track Protect. Here we go. In what year did the first video game come out? Woo! Good job, RJ! And everyone else, you all are paying attention. Are you taking screenshots? Just asking. Next, what country invented the first board game? Yes, you're right, Angelica. It is Egypt. What airline did the first frequent flyer program? Good job, Brune. All right, let's continue. So the timeline here now is now we're in 2002. And Sears Gaming Initiatives forges the link between the gaming industry and realizing it, it actually helps when it comes to training, health, education, and public Sorry, policy. I didn't quite catch that. And 2003, Nick Pelling coins the term gamification. In 2007, Bunchball created Dunder Mifflin Infinity, a gamified website for the TV show The Office. It receives over 8 million page views in six weeks. In 2009, Quest to Learn accepts a class of sixth graders into a game-based learning environment. And in 2010, DevHub adds a point system to its website and increases its user engagement by 70%. In 2010, Gamification Co. holds the first gamification summit Guess where? San Francisco. And in 2012, 45,000 enroll in a Professor Kevin Warbach's online gamification course, which was through Coursera. And in 2012, Mozilla Open's Badges initiative is launched. The open source badges can be used to mark accomplishments online. 2012, Gartner predicts that 70% of global 2000 organizations will have at least one gamified application by 2014. And in 2014, MT Research predicts that gamification will be a $2.8 billion industry by 2016, which is true, and it went beyond. It is now expected to become a $11 billion industry this very year. All right, don't worry. There's plenty of more times to win. Here we go. Oops, sorry. Who coined the term gamification? No, Vishal was an SF, but who coined the term gamification? I have to admit, this one is the hardest question usually. 
All right, we'll go to the next one. It's Nick Pelling. What was the gamified website by Bunchball for the TV show The Office called? Yes, RJ, good job. Gamification is expected to become a blank billion dollar industry by 20, oh wow, everyone. I think it was Zach, good job Zach. All right, that's the end of the pop quiz time or is this a trick? It will be a mystery, but let's dive right back into the presentation now. So, fact, InfoSec has always been gamified. Think about it, CTFs, hackathons, bug bounty, many of us became hackers to beat games and do better than our peers who are better than us. We found cheat codes and other methods for doing so, but most importantly, when we hunt for vulns, it's like a game of how far does the foxhole go? It's the constant, how can I outsmart this and that? So, of course I'm gonna do an InfoSec timeline, um, and it's way shorter than the previous ones, so pay attention. October 10th, 1995, Netscape launches the first ever cash reward for finding security bugs in their Netscape Navigator 2.0 beta. And the first DEF CON CTF was in 1996. Bug bounty programs were created and managed by companies such as Google, Facebook, and Mozilla. And those type of platforms are BugCrowd, HackerOne, and Synac. Pontu Own started in 2007, and bug bounty platforms were founded in 2012 and 2013. Now, if you think about it today, companies are using platforms like this to provide training for their security teams more than ever before. And that includes actually the company that I work for, Point3. So, like promise, it's back. Another round of pop quiz time. The first bug bounty program was created in what year? 1995, good job, Eric. When was the first CTF at DEF CON? Oh, Zach, 1996, good job. What are the three major bug bounty companies in the order of creation? Angelica, you are close. Zach, you are correct. It's Bugcrowd, HackerOne, and Cynic. That is the end of pop quiz time, but don't worry. This is a complete gamified talk, so there's a lot more. So now we're gonna dive into a little bit about how our brains are stimulated by it. And first we need to get to know your brain. So if you see here, those pop quiz questions stimulate the green section of the brain, the temporal lobe. And now we're gonna dive into that area and the area where gamification thrives. So what is the temporal lobe? The temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory input and to derive meanings for the appropriate retention of visual memory, language comprehension, and emotion association. It is where gamification thrives and when the amygdala and hippocampus are. And yes, there's an activity. You guys ready? Rolling up sleeves, unless you're wearing a t-shirt. If you are, then pretend. All right, fill in the blank. I would say shout the answers out, but you're not here, so you can do the writing in. You ready? A plant having a permanently woody main stem, usually growing to a high height and developing branches at some distance from the ground. What is it? Yes, tree. All right, the nutritious orange to yellow root of a plant of the parsley family. Yes, yeah, smell like carrot. An article of furniture consisting of a flat top supported on one or more legs. Yes, Eric Table. An institution where instruction is given. School, correct. A moving carriage for carrying pastures from one level to another. Yes, Jordan, elevator. A device for transmission of sound or speech to a distant point. Phone, Lily, good job. A body of water of considerable size surrounded by land. Yes, Malik, it's lake. A domestic fowl bred for its flesh, eggs, and feathers. Yes, Sherry, it is a chicken. A shallow, usually circular dish from which food is eaten. Plate, good job. A precipitation in the form of ice crystals. Yes, Anna, it is snow. 
Any circulating medium of exchange. Currency, correct. That one's a hard one. All right. So what that activity did was that it controlled a different parts of your brain. First, it tests out your imagery and your memory, but also it was about timing. So the amygdala helps with the timing part. The hippocampus helps with your memory, connecting visual and a word along with it. So what is the hippocampus exactly? It's the memory storage and GPS system of your brain. What does that mean? It's where short-term memories in the hippocampus are then transferred to long-term memories in the temporal lobe. Our conscious memories are formed by the hippocampus taking a snapshot of short-term working memory and committing it to a long-term memory stored in the temporal lobes. Another activity, you guys ready? We're gonna test your hippocampus now. The previous one was temporal lobe. This time it's hippocampus. And here we go. I want you to look at this list. I want you to read it to yourself. I'll give you read through once, then a second time. All right, next step. Now, the next step is the following. You have two minutes to complete this task. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is draft an email, a doc, or pull up a notes app on your computer. I will give you 10 seconds to get this done. So on your computer, open somewhere where you can take down notes. Everyone ready? All right. Now you're gonna do is write down those objects that you just saw in the order that they appeared. You have two minutes to complete this task. Ready, set, and go. You have two minutes. You have one minute and 26 seconds. You have one minute and nine seconds. You have less than one minute. You are now leaning towards 52 seconds. You have 35 seconds now. You have 18 seconds now. Five, four, three, two, one, and you're done. Wasn't that hard? That was super hard, I'm not gonna lie. This is the list. So I know that was really hard to do and it is very hard to do, but this is what uh, people that have memorization, they play these uh, contests and whatnot, these competitions. And basically what they do is they think of a game and, and by a game, I think of a memory. So what you do is when you see a list like this, you want to memorize things, you want to come up with something that's really crazy. So for example, I was walking around in London and carrying an umbrella because it was raining and I noticed my shoe was untied. But when I was going to look down and like tie it, I saw there was a cuddly toy on the side of the road. And it was weird because right next to it was a 
a, like a melon that was like rotting right underneath this tree. And then I just, I started walking again and then I almost tripped because I was looking at what I just saw. It looked like a pirate, but I almost actually tripped on this yogurt because the, and I, I don't know why that yogurt was there, but it was there. And then this parrot was on that pirate. So I was really distracted, but I'm so glad that I didn't fall because I have to admit my laptop was in my bag and it would have been destroyed. And not just that, my red jumper. And this red jumper means a lot because I, this is what I usually wear when I go and play basketball. So this is how people memorize these things. It's a visual, um, you have to connect the visual with the word to be able to recall the details. So in order to improve your hippocampus, research has shown that crossword puzzles, taking a new route home, meaning don't take the same route every time, will help you improve your hippocampus and also gaming modules, believe it or not. So let's dive into the amygdala. Now, the amygdala is my favorite part of the brain because it is a survival mechanism, the fight versus flight. And basically what that means is it helps separate who is like me, who is not like me. And these are socially constructed beliefs. So say, for example, someone told you, always be afraid of the person with pink hair. Now, this might, this is like one of those ideas that as a child you're told people with pink hair are dangerous individuals. So what happens is that every time you see someone with pink hair, you might hold your purse a little bit closer or you might cross the street because you see this person with pink hair. Now the problem is with that is that this is also the reason why we have so many prejudices and biases and we have a lot of issues in our society because we have these ideas that we are told as a child or through media or whatnot that are actually not true because the person with pink hair just has pink hair. It doesn't mean anything other than that. So the only way that we question that is if we actually hear their stories. That's the only way that we question our socially constructed beliefs. But don't worry, the amygdala it checks in with the prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain, to see whether or not it needs to react. So no longer is it something that's subconscious, it becomes conscious. But the amygdala, the most important part of this, it works on timing. The amygdala is an almond-shaped section of your nervous tissue located in the temporal side lobe of the brain, which is responsible for your emotions, your survival instincts, and your memory. And you really, like I said, you can't control it. Only the prefrontal can because it is completely subconscious. But this is what we use when we're on a time. Me counting down those minutes, those seconds earlier, that forces you to react faster, but also for you to speed up the way that you think. All right, we're gonna do another activity now. And hopefully my sound works very well because this is a video. Here we go. Can you actually hear this? Can someone put it in there if you can hear it or not? No, okay, don't worry. Now let's try. Watch this series of images very closely. Ready? Go. Do you recall seeing any shoes or keys? Probably not. At this speed, 80% of the people we showed this to don't see either the shoes or the keys. We'll slow it down. Did you see them this time? You probably did. Now, we're gonna play a different series of images. Did anyone see the keys or the shoes? Okay, you guys are really good. Majority of people do not see that. Now, here we go again. You ready? images and test you on them after. Ready? Go. Have you noticed any snakes or spiders? Chances are you did. If you're thinking we slowed down the images, I assure you we did not. All we did was substitute the shoes and keys with pictures of snakes and spiders. Why did one set of images jump out at you while the other didn't? To answer that question, you do not need to know from Conran. I'm going to teach you anything. So, 
the one thing, oh, I'll just go back to this. So just to briefly summarize what happened was that for many people, they didn't catch the keys and I mean the keys on the shoes because it's everyday items. But when your amygdala is on fire, in other words, when we see things that we were socially constructed to believe of a threat, so spiders and snakes are one of those things that we've been told like stay away, they're really, really dangerous. Um, that's the reason why we actually freak out. And so we actually pay faster attention. So remember, your amygdala can actually take over to a certain extent. And I don't know if anyone's ever been in a car accident before, but if you have, there's a moment when you've had really bad ones where everything seems like it's in slow motion. Now, what this is called is amygdala hijack. It's when you no longer have control of your prefrontal part of your brain. Instead, what's happening is your amygdala has taken over completely. So everything seems a lot slower because you're 100% focused on that very moment because of fear and you're in survival mode. So you go in this when you're in survival mode. And so just remember that the amygdala in the hippocampus play a huge role when we're doing gaming. And if you are really scared of spiders or snakes, I feel you. I hate, I hate spiders with, yeah, I hate spiders. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how now, why gamification helps security teams. Let's be real, certs are not enough. There's new tools and new exploits that come out all the time and being aware of everything at all times and the trends along with burnout, lack of team members, it leaves us in a huge security risk. So I mean, how many of you guys have experienced a shortage on your team and having to take on other hats to help everything move along? A lot all the time, right? I feel you, Sherry and RJ. <clears throat> and that's exactly the problem, is that's why we need to dive into, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> Let's dive into why it's needed more than ever and how it's becoming a priority for the InfoSec community. In 2020, gamification combined with the other latest technologies and trends will have a significant impact on the design of employee performance globalization of higher education and innovation. Let's dive into some more facts, shall we? And if you hear my dog right now, she is wow. nipping me because she wants attention. Sherlock, it's okay, honey. I'll be there in a, in a little bit later. All right, uh, fact number one, within organizations that hold gamification exercises, hackathons, and capture the flag, red team, blue team, or bug bounty programs are the most common. And almost all, 96% of those use gamification in the workplace report seeing actual benefits. Fact number two, more than half, 57% of respondents report that using game increases awareness, IT staff knowledge of how breaches can occur. And 43% said gamification enforces a teamwork culture needed for a quick, effective cybersecurity program. And 77% of senior managers agreed that their organization would be safer if they used more gamification. Fact three, we are now heading towards a 3 million shortage of personnel. To address the shortage in skilled cybersecurity workers, the report suggests that gamers, those engaged and immersed in online competitions may be the logical next step to plug in the gap. Nearly all, 92% of respondents believe that gaming affords players an experience and skills critical to cybersecurity threat hunting, such as logic, perseverance, and understanding of how to approach adversaries and a fresh outlook compared to a traditional cybersecurity hires. Sherlock, please stop biting me. All right, back four. 77% of employees find game-based training to be more effective than traditional training methods. That's right. How many of you guys remembered what you learned in the classroom when you were in fifth or sixth grade? Do you ever remember those pop quiz tests back then? Yeah, I didn't think so. Reading a book is great and everything, but many of us don't learn that way. Practical and action ways of like basically where it's hands-on is the fastest way for us to learn knowledge. Fact five, biases, resumes, and team building learning how to improve teams and providing more trainings and investment in employees is the most important thing. And gamification helps with finding talent recognition. And how do they do that? Well, I'm not trying to plug my, my company in, 
but we do have something that basically it's a program that you can use to see if a candidate is actually able to do their role or their job. So basically think of a gamified version of their role and then testing them to see if they're good at what they do. I think of this as a better way because I don't know about you, biases do exist. So if I put out a resume out there and being a woman and whatnot, they may not see me as something technical because of my gender. And because of that, they are not gonna take me as seriously through the pipeline. So one of the things is by getting rid of names and getting rid of this whole thing about certs as showing everything that the person's able to do their job, why not just test them? So we get rid of the resume idea, we forget about certs because at the reality of this, in InfoSec, it really doesn't matter. It's about do you have what it takes to do this role? And that's all we need to know is are you able to perform? Because certs aren't gonna do anything in a sense. They're only gonna help you get into the door, the doorway and whatnot, but it's really your ability to perform. And years of experience is also misleading because you can have less than one or two years of experience and actually be a top performer. And we have seen that and research has seen that as well. The top performers don't usually have the certs or actually have the years of experience that uh, jobs are requiring for a job role. And because of that, we now also are dealing with a shortage, but we also have a skills gap. And because, think about it, skills gaps are also happening because it's we're not having the time to learn new material or we don't have time to do other things so how are we going to practice our own skills it's really challenging especially if you have kids and especially when you're like right now at home having to stay at home and you have kids running around it's hard to find time. And with the skills gap and everything, it's also pushing people to burn out because they're having to force themselves to learn really fast, especially when they have less team members. And then also at this point, it also adds up to having breaches later on. And tell me, you guys, what is the percentage of companies that adopt gamification in workplace report seeing benefits? Angelica, 96%, good job. So we dived a little bit into, you know, the stats of gaming, we've dived into the brain. Now we're gonna dive a little bit about what gamification has done to transform lives. And most importantly, gamification has, can teach us and lead new people to enter the space or to be recognized for their talent. And this could solve the gender biases that InfoSec has been dealing with ongoing. And it's not just gender, it's anyone who's underrepresented in this field is really struggling to get their foot in the door and also to stay within it. So gamification can really help us with the 3 million personnel shortage right now. And I wanna tell you a little bit about Veronica. So Veronica, she has a BA in computer science and this is by accident. She planned to actually study Latin and Greek but also took a computer science class. But when leaving college, she started having a more of an interest of starting a PhD instead. Um, so, but she wanted to make sure if this is for her or not. So she did youth development for about five years after graduating, she loved it, but she didn't feel like it challenged her in the way that inspired and empowered her. So she was basically looking around, seeing if there was anything out there or program. And she came across a partnership with the DOD bootcamp and it drew her to it. They were saying in there, you don't have to have any experience whatsoever in InfoSec, but they're looking for people that are good at problem solving ability and being able to work on problems for a long time and willingness to do discipline learning. And that was all that they put in the blurb. They also say that you need to be open to working with patterns and puzzles. So she started the reverse engineering challenge and this was all on the Escalate platform and afterwards, because she was so good is that uh, she went to go work for a consulting company for about six months within InfoSec right after that program. And her favorite thing was reverse engineering. Her actual title at the time was a consultant as a pen tester. And afterwards, uh, point three, uh, basically tried to pull her in. And so they shared that they had an opening, I was wondering if she would like to join because her performance was so amazing during the boot camp. And so now she works um, with us and it's been over a year now. 
She never set out to be a hacker. You should know this. Um, but what she did realize was that if she were to go through her Google search, she would look into seeing that she was always wondering about web app strategies and how one can manipulate to change it and shape, even when she was doing her youth development for about five years after graduating. The next person is Valentina. Valentina, she lives in Chicago, Illinois, and she first studied psychology and wasn't a big fan of math. Yet she took a math class in college and suddenly discovered she happened to have a love for math, which is very common for many of us. How many of us have gone into like, we're doing math back in school before college and we're like, this is the worst thing in the world. And then suddenly you go to college, you're like, oh wait, this is math, this is so much better. Um, so she went to school then to study math at UIC and she did an undergrad uh, internship in the physics department, which she had to learn basic coding and took some classes in computer science as well. Afterwards, she became an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank a bank and then discovered there was a passion in computers. The ability to tell what a computer what to do and build anything was something that was really empowering for her. And she really wanted to learn a little bit more and computer security sounded really interesting, maybe because of hacking and hacking away sounded really pretty cool to her. Plus she saw it in movies and just, it was seemed so interesting. And her favorite, favorite, favorite movie at the time that inspired her was the movie Hackers. And it was that early computer internet culture and the hacker community image that she really, um, it drew her to it. So when she saw a press release from the mayor of Chicago, um, there was something on there saying they're looking for applications for a special boot camp, which was sponsored by Escalate and DOD. And this, once again, it didn't state you have to have an infosec background, a computer science background. You just need to know to have that passion for our puzzles and this tenacity to never keep looking and whatnot. So she had zero experience. Remember, she only really knew basic coding and took like A class in computer science, econ and whatnot, but with zero experience within the first three months of her six month boot camp, she got a job immediately as a software developer. And now she's a vulnerability researcher, which is fantastic. And honestly, there's a lot of other stories that I've heard, but I would love to hear if any of you guys have had a story that's similar to any of Veronica or Valentina. And yes, that is Sherlock there. I have an obsession with my puppy. Um, so tell me guys, which person was inspired by the movie Hackers? Valentina, good job, Jeremy. And yes, I love war game, Sherry. It's such an awesome movie. All right. Um, from stories, brain functioning, and history, it is clear that gamification is a necessity. So we can all be superheroes every single day. And I want to share now in the last bit here is that on Thursday, we launched a hack to help CTF. So if I were you guys, if you're interested in doing a CTF, this is perfect. Everyone is able to do this. And the grand prize winner will have the opportunity to have a point three to write a donation on behalf of their honor to either mental health hackers or innocent lives, which is very, very important to do. And we're also looking at some other orgs. So in case if the winner wants to pick another one, they'll have a chance to. We're looking at the food bank. So make sure to check out this. It's a lot of fun and it's three weeks wrap like long so you need to participate now in the first release then there's a second one and whatnot and i will definitely post the link in slack um also this is a really important time to note that there are some resources that i may have shared or may have not shared so i wanted to take this time to do that um, many of you guys probably were on the earlier uh, presentation from Alyssa miller um, but her and phil wiley and myself we are all involved with the um, ITSP Magazine Uncommon Journey podcast. We basically interview people like that you guys like to follow on Twitter, and we ask them about their personal lives before they got into InfoSec and what were the lessons learned when they entered. So it's really fun to check it out and whatnot. The Hacker Book Club is something that I created recently. So it's basically we read um, like uh, books that are written by hackers in our community and the community that we are in. 
also reads them. And anyone can join. We have weekly virtual meetings. It's every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. People bring their wine, they bring their beer or whatnot, or drink your water or your tea, it's up to you. And then um, we will be starting a new book in about two weeks time uh, with Marcus Carey. It's gonna be Tribe of Hackers. It's a great book. And you may have heard or may have not heard yet, but I did create an ethical hackers right petition. And there's the link right there. And I would love for you guys to sign it. Um, I'm trying to get a thousand signatures. So if I get a thousand signatures, um, I can work and partner with DOJ, DOD and EFF it's really important that we get all these signatures and go beyond a thousand so we can do something about this and try to change the landscape that we are currently still in very much so. So please sign it or share it around. It's super important for us to do that. Last but not least, um, I did start up um, a hacker community COVID-19 volunteer chat support. This is not for a crisis or whatnot. This is for us to be like pen pals kind of thing but through uh, phone calls. Um, basically, I have partnered up with Mental Health Hackers and what we're doing is we're trying to find volunteers before we launch this program this um, upcoming week. So anyone can register to talk to someone anywhere between 10 minutes to one hour long. And it's a really great opportunity because many of us feel isolated and alone and we wanna talk to someone. So this is a great opportunity to make new friends possibly. You could talk about whatever you want. Um, from books to Netflix or to even how you're feeling, if you're concerned, your worries or whatnot. This is a great opportunity. We need to be together as a community more than ever before. Also, here are some two other ones that are really important. If you do talk to anyone who is suffering a lot and they need to talk to someone, there's a crisis text line. Um, and it's a great organization. It actually um, has therapists online. They're certified and whatnot, so they're able to help you. This is great to share with your friends and family if they need it. And also the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. If you are feeling a really deep in depression and you having some interesting thoughts, interesting but terrible thoughts, dark thoughts and whatnot, please call that line. It's really important. Uh, I know that all of us have lost someone at some point of time because of suicide. So please push those two out there for everyone in the community to know. It is super important right now for them to know that these are these resources while we go through this really hard time. I'm gonna open up to questions. Anyone have any questions? Zach, I'm glad that you know this one. Isn't it so good? If anyone has not seen this YouTube video, it will definitely make you laugh. Uh, just type in uh, David S. Pumpkin SNL. You will love it. I guarantee you it will make you laugh. At the beginning, you might be like, what the hell is this? And why did Chloe do this? But honestly, it is fantastic and amazing. And I think you will love it. And it's always good to laugh right now. Um, any other questions, anyone? If you feel a little bit shy asking questions, you're always welcome to DM me on Twitter. Um, my DMs are always open. Um, and also you can DM me here on Slack. And I just wanna say a big thank you uh, to Besides Atlanta for doing this, this virtual thing, and also for having me. And I am so thrilled to be here and with you guys. I just wanna also say, and I always end it, with thank you for existing because as I said earlier we all know someone who has felt isolated alone and I just want you to know that there's a wonderful community here that would love to support you in any single way possible so if you're feeling like you need to talk to someone my DMs are always open for you and I just want you to know thank you for existing because you're doing such incredible work by being in this field and taking the time to try to figure out and learn more about the community that we live in so thank you so much and last but not least, if you are wondering, oh yeah, um, who are the winners? Let's go into it right now. So, Matt Cable, congratulations. I need you to DM me either on Twitter or on Slack so I can get you your one month subscription. So congratulations. And I'm now gonna take a random, I'm using this wonderful random picker um, to generate who will be our second winner. So hold on one sec, let me press this.
All right, Angelica, congratulations. You are a winner for the second one. So you'll get one month subscription too. So please DM me either on Twitter or on Slack so I can get you your one month subscription. So once again, you guys, thank you so much for existing. Thank you to B Size Atlanta. My DMs are always open. So if you ever want to reach out to me at any point in time, please let me know. I am around. I'm always going to be here to support you. And that is what I like to do the most out of all that I do in InfoSec. So thank you so much, everyone. And oh, wait, hold on. You need to see Sherlock. I will go get Sherlock. Hold on one second. Yes, please. We always need that. Right? Sherlock. Okay, one sec. She's coming. Okay. This is Sherlock. Sherlock, you want to say hi? You want to say hi? No? Okay. <laughs> this is Sherlock, you guys. Yes, she, she weighs about 30, 33 pounds, I think. She put on some weight around the holidays. Um, she is roughly about almost two years old. She turns two in June. And yes, she is a Sheba. And she yes, is adorable. she has her own personality. It's beyond anything. Nice. Well, thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Sherlock, thank you. For, for being our moral support here. <laughs> uh, so our next talk in this track is at three o'clock. So we have about a 40 minute break here. Uh, so we will see you back then. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you. Thanks for having me.